we've got about uh, probably 45 minutes for you on the beautiful MPG yeah. Ranch. We know if you have to come and go, that's okay, too. So, Allie, did you have something to say? I do. I just want to show you guys so you can see this beautiful, beautiful vista behind us. And Joshua is going to talk a little bit about us. But what you can't see is what we are looking at. So I'm going to show you very, very quickly what we are looking at. And these are the Gorge Bitterroot Mountains. There they are. Oh, it's beautiful in the fog bank. And so that just kind of gives you an idea of what surrounds us. So go ahead, Joshua. Take it away. <clears throat> all right. Well, welcome to MPG Ranch. I'm thrilled to have you all with me here today. Uh, my name is Joshua, and I am the Education and Community Outreach Manager here at MPG. And one of many things that I do uh, is to run a population survey for mountain lions in the winter, which is what this challenge is all based around. And so I hire, oh, about nine other individuals, and we spend the entire winter out in the lands behind me and over, this is Mount Baldy back here, and over Mount Baldy into the forested lands behind. And we run around back there and follow mountain lions in the snow. And we, we are a non-invasive uh, project, which means we don't put collars on individuals. We don't dart them and handle them or mess with them at all. The whole idea is that we're going to leave them alone. Uh, and so we try not to run into them, um, but we still do run into them sometimes. And we follow them in the snow and we track ourselves with a GPS unit. And then, uh, then we know how they use the land. And then we uh, pick up hair and we pick up scat. Um, and then that goes to the lab and we can pull DNA out of that and know how many individuals we have and what our population is. Uh, Joshua, I have a question for the students and I'm going to ask it as a multiple choice question. There's going to be three choices. So you can either answer number one with your fingers number two with your fingers or number three with your fingers okay you use the word scat yes i'm wondering if the students out there in montana know what scat is is scat number one a song is scat number two a kind of tennis shoe or is scat poop that would be number three so let's everybody vote is it a song a tennis shoe or poop I see a lot of number threes out there. If you are on the live stream, you can go ahead and type that in. We have about six or seven schools <gasps> connected on the Seriously? live stream That is right so now. exciting. Okay. All right. So all of you who said number three, that it is poop, that is correct. We pick up mountain lion poop, and mountain lion poop is gross, so I'm really glad that it's frozen in the wintertime, and I guess we really should have made that choice number two, but... I know. So it I wasn't going to go yeah. there. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, quick little history on the valley here. Um, Bitterroot Mountains pushed up 90 some million years ago and made this beautiful valley. And then, for many thousands of years, this was, of course, the homeland to uh, the Bitterroot Salish people. And for for those who still live in the valley, it is still their homeland. Uh, it's the traditional the traditional uh, origins of those people. And um, and then Lewis and Clark came through in the early 1800s and marveled at the horses and complained about the cactus. And we moved forward to the like 1880s before Montana was a state. And you probably, those of you who are local to the valley probably know the last name McClay. So you've got the ski runs over there, which were Tom McClay's deal. And so his ancestor, David McClay, homesteaded on this land uh, in, in the late 1880s. and. Um, and then through marriages and all of that, it ended up with Bob and Jim Schrader, and they in turn then sold it to MPG. And so that land that we're standing on here has seen a lot of, a lot of human impacts. And so part of what MPG is trying to do is to get this back to basically native prairie. Um, so we've got a lot of grasses and a lot of invasive weeds and things that we're trying to deal with. Um, but we're set up like a, we're not a ranch, right? So we're called MPG Ranch, but really we are a biological research station. So we're like a scientific research spot and we study everything you can possibly think of to try to figure out what's going on here and then how to make this place as healthy and biodiverse as possible. 
That is amazing. So I have a question. Were mountain lions always here or have they just moved in? Mountain lions have always been here. So they've been a part of this landscape for a really, really long time. And um, I mean, we could get really complicated about it for their evolutionary history, yeah. but, <laughs> but basically speaking, yeah, they've been here the whole time. And so their interactions with people have been different um, over, over the years. And so with the indigenous people, they are accepted as part of the landscape. And then with the ranching history, those interactions become a little bit more contentious and there's more conflicts because as people bring domesticated livestock onto the land, then predators like to eat that livestock because they're really easy targets. Um, and so then you, then you start having a very different history of interaction with wildlife. That's amazing. So Joshua, let's get into the whole mountain lion thing. I wanna ask the students to right now turn and talk. I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds. I want you to brainstorm all the things you know about mountain lions, all the things you know about mountain lions. And if you're on the live stream, you can type those things in too and identify your school too so we know you. And then I'm gonna call on some schools and ask for one spokesperson at each school to give us an idea of what you already know about mountain lions. So go ahead, take about 10 seconds and talk about that. Go. And let's have the RS, uh, the live stream also tell us. I said that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> They're talking, I see them. I see it happening. I see a lot of thinking happening. I have a I have a question or I have a comment from the East End Colony. Awesome. East End Colony. What what comment do they have? Well that those students, they know that they can be dangerous, but they also know that they're carnivores. That's and true. And they can also weigh up to two hundred and fifty pounds. Well, we're gonna talk about that, I that bet. They can. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, let's uh Box Elder, can you unmute? and give us one thing that you know about mountain lions. Nice and loud. They eat squirrels. Is that She said they eat squirrels. That is true. Mountain lions eat many things and on the menu is squirrels for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Box Elder. Let's go to R. Lee. Is there one person there in R. Lee that could tell us anything about mountain lions that you know? Okay, we're going to come back to you. Let's go to Daly. Daly, are you there? We're here. Awesome. Do you have uh, one or two things you know about mountain lions? They're mammals. Is that true? That is true. What does that mean, Joshua? It means they are. And they are part of the cat family. They're part of the cat family. Also true. Doesn't it also mean that they have live babies? They have live babies. About how many usually? Ooh, that depends. Um, it can range anywhere from one to typically four is the upper end of that. We have seen uh, multiples of five go by. So we've seen our cameras. We've got a lot of cameras out here. So we've seen a mother with five babies, which is a lot of babies for a mountain lion. Um, but they will also sometimes adopt. So she could have gained some extra ones that way. Interesting. Thank you, Daly. Let's go to uh, one of the classes. How about Mrs. Riordan's class in at Hawthorne? Riordan, sorry. Yep, we're here. <clears throat> um, one thing about mountain lions is that they have retractable claws. <gasps> is that yes, true? That's so true and a really good thing to point out. So go ahead. show you this here. So these are life-size tracks of a mountain lion. And I can show you compared to my hand, right? So this is probably um, about the right size for a mature female. So they're not huge, but one of the things that you see is that the claws don't show. So sometimes in the snow, I will see claws, but they look very different than like a wolf track where you have the claws always out and always present. So the retractable claws is a really important thing to look for when you're tracking mountain lions. We have one more. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, go for it. 
Mountain lions can climb trees. Yes, I find mountain lions and trees quite a lot, actually. So they spend a lot of time up there. In the winter, we find them here in some of the draws behind me. It gets really excellent afternoon light. And so they'll climb up there and just sun themselves in the trees. Very good. They'll also hide from you in the trees. Okay, and I think Chinook just popped off. So let's go to Florence Carlton. Florence Carlton, did you have one thing? They're small. Some of them well, are. Some of them are. <laughs> some of them are. The babies are definitely small. They and this is so here we can show you. This is the pelt of a mountain lion, so the skin of a mountain lion. And this is not a particularly large individual, but you can see that mountain lions are, are kind of like people in terms of how much they weigh. So a a female mountain lion is kind of like you know, weighs as much as a, an adult uh, woman, and then a, a male mountain lion weighs as much as an adult man. And so you can kind of think about it that way, speaking just kind of generally. But one of the things to note here too is they have a really long tail that helps them with balance as they are uh, hunting and moving through the landscape. You can also see that the color of their fur is really good for this landscape behind me. They blend in really well, so the camouflage works great for them. And I can try to bring a foot up here. You can see too, um, they do have those retractable claws. You can see some of them poking out here uh, in this in this lion hide. But yeah, the babies are quite small and super adorable and they have spots when they come out and they make all these really cute noises too. Great, I had a question about, yes. do mountain lions jump very far? Mountain lions can jump really far. How far? <laughs> <laughs> so a mountain lion can jump about 40 feet, which means... Shall I go? Go for it. This far? I'd further than that. This far? A little further. More? A little further. More? You're getting closer. Probably about there. So this is about 40 feet away, which because of the camera angle, it even looks much further. But if you think about it, like a mountain lion could jump two lanes of traffic uh, on a highway and land on the other side or land in the, the median in the middle, which is pretty incredible uh, to just be able to jump that from a, a standstill. That's amazing. Yeah, oh. it's like a superhuman feat. Um, do we have any questions on the our, on the stream, on the live stream? We have some interesting things. So one of the things is Colville says that, um, and I wanted to check on this, that mountain lions are found in the mountains. Is that their only habitat? Is mount, are mountains mountain lions only habitat? Uh, no, you can find them in the deserts. You can find them in the in the swamps, and you can you can find them all over the place. There's all sorts of different names for them around the country: pumas, cougars, catamounts. So they they have a, a wide range of habitat that they will exist in. Um, but mountains are chief among them, and so that's where they get the name mountain lion, definitely. And so. Here on the ranch, we see them in the forested mountainous lands behind us. We see them in the, the scrub like bitter brush and sagebrush. And we don't see them a whole lot out here in the grasslands because there's not a lot of cover for them if the grass isn't tall enough. And we see them a lot in drainages and things like that. And they'll get down into the floodplain sometimes too. Was there another comment? Well, there was one interesting comment from Colville High School. Um, they have a lot of mount, or mountain lions in Colville, Washington, oh, wow. and their school has been on lockdown before because they've had uh, mountain lions or cougar is what they was what they say in Washington um, well, on the in Washington on the playground. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it happens here too. We end up with mountain lions uh, near bus stops and things like that, and then. Yeah, it freaks everybody out. Um, by raise of hand, students around Montana, have any of you ever uh, had a mountain lion on your playground? <laughs> Don't know. I can't hands? see that. Yeah, I there's kind of a glare on the screen, so I can't see you all too well. <laughs> all right. Well, tell us a little bit, Joshua, about your work here with those those crazy mountain lions that we've just heard about yeah so like i was saying in the winter time we'll, we'll go out and we'll study we'll we'll track them we'll 
uh, make maps from the GPS information and we will um, we'll find kill sites and then we'll do kind of an analysis of the kill site of what's going on, find out what they're eating, find out the health of, of what the prey is. And because we have such an extensive camera network on the ranch, um, there's some like 300 cameras out here. We're able to get some really remarkable footage and we're able to identify individuals sometimes, which is really great. So we can pick up some DNA at one point and then I can go back through the camera footage and determine like this is this individual and then we have photographs and videos of those individuals. And, and so how many individuals do you have here and what kind of family groups? So we have identified 19 individuals in our study area, which is MPG Ranch, which is 16,000 acres. And then we're in some surrounding Nature Conservancy and Forest Service lands. So the complete study area is probably closer to 30 to 50,000 acres. Uh, but 19 individuals is a lot uh, for that, that area. So what we're finding is the females have very stable ranges. They tend to, to you know, stay, stay in a particular spot. Um, and the ranges here don't seem to be very large and they seem to overlap a lot. And then we have males that are a little bit more on the move and they'll pass through an area or they're born here and then they have to go somewhere else because the, the breeding male doesn't want them here. Um, and then we've had a couple of different breeding males over the past couple seasons. And what we found is that those are the individuals that are often harvested by hunters. So we've lost some individuals in the study uh, to hunting as well. Now, some of the students may not know, some of the Montana students probably do, but the other students may not know that are we in a wilderness here or are we close to humans? We're very close to humans on the ranch. Um, as those of you in Florence Carlton right across the way definitely know, uh, the Bitterroot Valley is home to a lot of people. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of interaction between the populated areas and these these more wild lands. So it's the wildland urban interface and that can be really amazing and beautiful and that's often why everybody wants to live here is because we're so close to these wild places but it can create issues too like you get a mountain lion on your playground <laughs> um i would like to go to chinook if they're on chinook do you have a question for joshua um where if like where would let's say a predator was around mountain lions like a bear or something um, where would the mom hide her babies or like protect her babies? How would she do that? So what we what we run into is we'll see that to a certain age they use a den site um, and they'll have them in there but they uh, they're out and moving with the mother pretty quickly and what we have seen and we haven't seen a lot of bear and mountain lion interaction we don't see a lot of uh, predation bears doing anything to mountain lion babies but I'm sure it could potentially happen what we have seen on camera footage is that when there are bears around and there are mountain lions around often the mountain lion is aware of the bear well in advance and just gets out of there and so they just sneak away into the forest and, and escape great Chinook do you have another question because you've got two classrooms in there Hi, Dylan how long is the normal lifespan of a mountain lion? That is a fantastic question. Um, the upper end is usually about 13 years in the wild. So if you've got like say an 11 year old mountain lion, that's getting to be pretty old. Um, and then in captivity, you can add another like 10 years to that or maybe double it. Great. Um, let's go back to Hawthorne School, and we had Miss Reardon, but let's have one of the other teachers from Hawthorne. And I'm sorry I don't have that on my list, but go ahead. Un one of you unmute. <laughs> there we go. Wait, wow. How old do the baby mountain lions leave their mother? Uh, it's usually about like a, a year to 18 months and then they'll they'll disperse and we have right now um we have a, a breeding female that we've called uh, f2 and we've known about her for a long time and so for the past two winters she's had babies and she had a young baby because mountain lions don't have a breeding season they'll breed any time of year so she had a baby two winters ago 
named F9, and she had a few more babies this last winter, and they're all still hanging out together. So last year's, you know, from two years ago is, is still with, with her mother, at least as of this last winter. So it's been interesting to see that, and we're hopefully going to be able to show you some videos of them all hanging out together in a little bit. That'd be great. Um, how about Daily? Do you have a question, Daily School? Thanks, Hawthorne. Because they are part of the cat family, do they purr? They make a lot of really interesting noises. I guess, like, some of them sound like a purr. I don't know if I'd, I'd call it a purr, but they, like, short answer is, yeah, they do something that definitely sounds like a purr. They also make a lot of, like, really weird squeaking noises that sound like a dog squeaky toy. Um, and so that seems to be the more common vocalization that I hear between mothers and young. The little babies make these like little high pitched squeaks and the moms make a, a slightly deeper squeak, but it's still really high pitched. And that's how they, they call to each other. Um, if we can, we'll show you some video of that in a minute, but uh, also we'll put links on it in the challenge platform if you're doing the challenge so yeah. that you can see those videos. Cause yeah, that's, and you can hear those vocalizations because really they're really interesting and totally not what you'd expect. Yeah. Let's see if Arlie, Arlie, are you there? Do you have a question? We have questions. We're trying, Arlie. Okay, how about one from Box Elder? How do you tell a male from a female at a distance? That is a really excellent question. So that can be very hard. Um, your, your male lions or mountain lions are typically bigger. So what I look for in the tracks are the track size is going to be different between a, a large mature male and a mature female. Um, and then their stride length, like how, how far between their footsteps, that will be bigger. Um, but at a distance, it would be a really hard thing to say because they look so similar. There are certain things that you can identify. There's a little black spot on the rear end of a male mountain lion that you may or may not be able to see depending on the angle of it. So that's a really good way to, to positively identify a male. But otherwise, it has to do with size. And what you run into is a, a smaller male, a juvenile, can be the exact same size as a mature female. And so then it gets really difficult to tell who's who out there. And so our best bet to be really accurate with that is either you have to be close um, so you can make that positive ID with that black spot or um, you need DNA. And so we, we go with the DNA because we don't want to try to get that close to lions. But that's a good question. They look so similar, it's really hard to tell them apart. Now, Joshua, will remind us the DNA comes from? The DNA comes from hair and it comes from poop. Hair and poop. Okay. Um, Ellie, did we have some questions on the live feed? We do. The East End Colony School um, is really curious if you see other types of cats um, on the ranch as well. Yeah. We see a lot of bobcats on the ranch as well. And bobcats can get pretty big. Um, so there are times that bobcat tracks can be about the size of a, of a small mountain lion or their stride length can be about the size of a small mountain lion. Some of the, the large male bobcats can get quite big. But yeah, so if for cats on the ranch, we have mountain lions and we have bobcats. Uh, we are not good lynx habitat here, so no lynx. Great, okay. Uh, did, was there anything else on stream? That's it for right now. Okay. You know, in the challenge platform, the students are learning about mountain lions, but they're also learning about habitat. And that's why we wanted to be here at this beautiful ranch yeah. is to show you where they live so yeah. that you can start to put together your recommendations about whether or not this is good mountain lion habitat. So talk a little bit about that with us. Will you in? Sure. So what makes good habitat? Yeah, let's zoom in on some of this land yeah, behind us. The way. In the fog. In the fog. <laughs> yeah. So what are we looking at right here? So you're looking at the forested top of Mount Baldy and then some of the uh, western facing slopes. And this is great habitat. So we have these tight drainages 
Uh, they're forested, they have good cover in them. We have a lot of sagebrush and bitterbrush that also provides good cover. Um, Why would a mountain lion need good cover? Because they are a stalking predator, so they're going to sneak up on things. Their preferred method of hunting is to move stealthily through the forest and sneak up on something and ambush it. Uh, whereas, say for like a wolf or a coyote, their preferred method is going to be to kind of go for a jog through the forest and then they smell something and they go chase it down. Um, so they've got different tactics there. Um, so having good cover and good camouflage is really useful. But really what dictates good habitat is food. Um, we have a lot of deer on the property. We have a lot of things that mountain lions like to eat. And we have good water sources uh, back off in the forests. So everything needs water. Great. Um, and then what are some of the things that you're doing to improve the habitat here? Yeah, so a lot of, you can't see them too well because of the fog bank, but you see a lot of drainages coming down off of Baldy here. And because of, uh, because of agricultural impacts, we have, um, we've lost some cover in those drainages. So bears and mountain lions don't like to go from the forest to the floodplain because there isn't a lot of vegetation in there. So some of the efforts that we're doing that will improve habitat for them is that we are revegetating those draws by planting lots of things. Um, planting things that will provide good habitat for stuff that they like to eat and for them to hunt. Do you ha ever have students help you with the work that you're doing here on the ranch? So I will hire people in the winter time for the program. I hire about eight people every winter and we go out and work in teams. Some of those are university students. And then another opportunity that I offer in the winter is for people to come out here and learn to track. So you don't need any experience. It can be any age group. It doesn't matter. Come out on the ranch and we'll just wander around in the snow and we'll track what we find. And if we do find mountain lions, then you can help with the study and we'll pick up hair and we'll talk about how to survey everything. Um, and if we find other things, then we'll just identify tracks and learn how to how to snow track. Can they come with classes? Like you can definitely come trips? with classes as a field trip, absolutely. So our roads are pretty passable to get to uh, the ranch house or a couple we have a couple houses on the property and you can get to the top house and we can start from there and then go have an adventure and then come back and so it's yeah I really do encourage uh, classrooms to come out and teachers if you're local um, and can make that happen we have uh, transportation grants to help offset the cost of buses because I know that can be a pain for teachers amazing so I'm gonna ask the students right now to pretend like they're out here in the winter with Joshua and they're tracking along and they're tracking along and they see a mountain lion okay I want you to take 10 seconds to turn and talk what are some of the things that you would be sure you needed to do if you came across a mountain lion Take about 10 seconds and then we'll get some responses. Okay, let's come back in five, four, Three, two, one. Let's start with our friends in Florence Carlton. You're right here with us and with these mountain lions. What would you do? You would act big and freeze. Act big and freeze. Okay. That's what Florence Carlton says. Let's go to Box Elder. What do you think, Box Elder? <laughs> I think that um, I will get some piece of hair if it fell down or okay. like its <laughs> size. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. So you're collecting hair samples. You're not going to worry about it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Arlie, are you Arlie. on it all? Can you respond or no? Okay. East Colony says that you should 
asks, should you run, should you run or should you cover your neck like you do with a bear? Okay, run or cover your neck. Don't answer yet. Oh, okay, we're going to hear from, let's hear from uh, the third teacher at Hawthorne. What do your students say they would do? All right, thanks. Um, I would slowly back up. And I, I'm always near my car, so I'd be close to my car, and I'd slowly back up and get my car and drive away. Okay, slowly backing up, getting in the car. Awesome. Thank you, Hawthorne. How about Daily? Daily, what do you think you'd do? you got to act really big and be really noisy so, so they'll be afraid of you. So we've got another acting really big. And how about Chinook? Chinook, are you on? You should cover. You should cover, and and make sure they can't see you and stay far away. Okay, I love all those ideas. Yeah. Let's let our expert uh, say what he does when he sees them. What would you do, Joshua? Uh, so it depends a lot on the situation. So if I encounter a mountain lion from a distance, or there's one up in a tree, and it's not an aggressive interaction where they're just they're fine where they are, and I'm fine where I am then I just, I just leave them be and give some space between us and I'll keep very aware of that individual and I'll increase the space between us. Backing away is always a really good call because um, you don't want to turn and run from a mountain lion because it will, they'll have a predator response and they'll, they'll come after you. Mountain lions don't want to attack you head on. They, if, it's gonna, if they're gonna do anything, they're gonna try to get you from behind. So, um, you don't want to turn and run, and if you have an aggressive encounter with a mountain lion, then yeah, you want to be big, you want to be loud, you, you can throw things, you can pick backpacks up above your head, um, that kind of thing. You can sheltering in a vehicle is a really good idea. Um, but these are all very rare things that typically do not happen. Mostly mountain lions don't care about us. Have you ever had any, or any of your researcher friends had any inter encounters, close we encounters? We have had some close encounters. Um, I ran into a mountain lion, now you can't see it because the fog all rolled in, but behind me there uh, <laughs> is an area we call sheep camp, and uh, sheep camp drainage. I was out tracking with a group and we uh, found a mountain lion in a tree just above us, and this was a very peaceful interaction. The whole group was able to see this individual lion the lion wasn't stressed, we weren't stressed, and then we just, we left the area and gave it some space, and so that was really nice. I've also run into them uh, in the dark when I was younger, uh, out backpacking, because I did not yet know what what the, the mother and young vocalization sounded like, and so I walked closer to that thinking, what the, what is this? And I got yelled at by a mom, so I was really glad that that ended there. And then we had uh, a researcher last winter who stuck his head in a den site to take a look, thinking that the den was unoccupied and had a mountain lion yell at him and jump out over his shoulder, which was very, very exciting for him and the lion. But uh, <laughs> thankfully we've never had any injuries because we, we work really hard to not run into them, to try to give them space and, and not bother them. Great. Well, what other animals are here on the ranch that the students need to know about, particularly to think about solving their challenge? What yeah. other animals live here? So we have about everything you can think of here on the ranch. Um, we have the mountain lions, the bobcats, uh, deer, mule deer and white-tailed deer, quite a few elk, lots of squirrels, lots of weasels, um, all kinds of birds, all kinds of... Um, you know, turtles and amphibians and all sorts of things. So we have a really wide assortment of animals. We have black bears, but no grizzly bears. Not yet. We probably will at some point, but we don't yet. Um, so we have almost everything you can think of does live here. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and go down the list again and see if the students have any particular questions for Joshua. Um, thinking students particularly about habitat, and what you've learned about mountain lions. And you know, you've got the expert here. Let's let's get some great questions for him and go ahead and start with Box Elder. How fast do all mountain lions run? Ooh. Oh, that is a really great question. I'm not 100% sure on this one, but I want to say it's probably, it's like over 30 miles.
miles an hour, like they can outrun us and outrun deer, no problem. Because they have to be able to catch deer and and kill them with their teeth. So they're very fast. That brings up a question for me. But they're um, not like cheetah fast. How how many like how many deer did they need to eat? Uh, so what they need to eat and how often they need to eat, again, depends on the individual and depends on whether they have young and depends how successful they are. Because they'll eat squirrels, they'll eat grouse, they'll eat whatever they can, they can catch. Um, but if they were going to be just eating deer, you know, they'd have to kill a deer every couple of weeks or something like that to feed themselves. Uh, and if they're a mother with young, then, then they, they have to do that probably even slightly more frequently, like a week and a half. Great. Vox Elder, did you have one more question? <coughs> Sorry, the fog's rolling in. <coughs> How did the mountain lion get its name? Oh, it's luck. How did the mountain lion get its name? I think that's a great question. Now, I don't really know, but I'm going to guess because they were they were uh, thought of as the lion that lived in the mountain. I've heard, uh, well, I've read stories about. Um, the colonial times on the East Coast, and that the Native Americans would bring uh, hides in, and that the colonists were always like, "Why are you only killing female lions?" You know, because they didn't have a mane, and they didn't realize that this was an entirely different species. And so the the Native Americans would joke with them that the the male lions were just much too ferocious. <laughs> but my guess is because they were lions that lived in the mountains, and they got that name. But there are all kinds of different names for them all around the country. So you have like uh, the mountain lion, the, the cougar, the puma, um, in New England they're called like the catamount, again kind of like the cat of the mountain. Um, some of them are like mountain screamer, they get all sorts of really interesting names uh, just based on where they are around the country. I think that sounds like a great writing idea. Yeah. Write us a story about how the mountain lion got its name. Um, okay, I'm going to try Arlie again. Arlie, any chance we're going to hear from you or just see you? Can we even see them? Oop. Okay, how about Daily? Daily, what? Two questions from you. Because they are carnivores, can they chew through bone? Uh, yes. So, mountain lions will chew through bones, but what I don't see them do is breaking long bones. So, like, femurs, um, or, or like the, the humerus, um, our, I will see wolves will break those or coyotes will break those and then eat the marrow. And that's not something I see in mountain lions. Those long bones are usually left intact. What I do see is that they'll eat into, into the ribs, into like the cartilage area, and then into some of the, the smaller ribs to open up that chest cavity. So in their, in their scat or in their poop, we do find pieces of bone, but it's, the fragments are different than what I find in wolf scat. Would that be something that you analyze kill sites for too, is, is learning about that? Yeah, absolutely. So scat identification is really important and knowing how an animal is, is consumed is really important because mountain lion, a mountain lion kill site and a wolf kill site or a bear kill site, they all look really different because they each eat things a different way. Uh, and there are parts of the, the animal that only bears will eat that that wolves or mountain lions won't, or you find long bones broken, which a mountain lion won't do typically. And so, yeah, these differences are really important. Great. One more question, Daly. Uh, you can just stand up there. Just if if they can't find any food, will they eat grass, or if they have babies, will they eat their babies? Ooh, I don't know about the babies question, um, and I don't. I don't think they eat grass at all. Like I know bears will certainly, but mountain lions seem to be pretty strictly carnivores. And what I unfortunately find is if they can't find food, um, they'll get to a certain point of malnourishment and then there's really kind of no return for them. And so unfortunately, young dispersing lions that are not good hunters um, can die of starvation that way. Sad. Okay. Yeah, very sad. Thank you, Daly. Let's start with, uh, let's go to Mrs. Reardon's class in Hawthorne. Which is more likely for mountain lions to um, hunt at night or to hunt at day? 
That is also a really awesome question. So what we see a lot of is that they'll, they'll hunt at night and they'll hunt a lot during the dawn and dusk times. Cause like, when do you go hunting? Right? So I go hunting at dawn and dusk because the animals are up and moving at that time. And so mountain lions will hunt at the same time because that's a really good time for them. Um, I see a fair amount of movement at night, but what I also then find is in areas where there are not a lot of people. Um, so say they like, deep in Davis Creek behind us over the fog bank, uh, mountain lions are more active during the day because they're not trying to hide from people. Awesome. Um, how about uh, one of the other teachers from Hawthorne? Go ahead, Mason. How many teeth do mountain lions have? How many teeth? Mm -hmm. I do not know the answer to that question. <gasps> oh, good. You get to look that one up and email it to Joshua. Yeah, so if you want to find out how many they have, let me know. Very good question. Let's go to that third teacher at Hawthorne. Did you do it? Yep, something happened. <laughs> this is actually a question for you. What, what college did you go to to get to get your job on the ranch? Oh, for me. Okay. So I have a background in, in education and I started at Temple University in Philadelphia. So I grew up in Pennsylvania and then I escaped and I came out here. And so I have a master's from the University of Montana as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. We just heard that Rattlesnake Elementary, yay, represent Missoula. We've yeah. got four classes from Missoula. I didn't know you were on Rattlesnake. Sorry. Do you have a Hello, question? We're all going to disappear in the fog here in a second. I know. <laughs> we really are here. You just yeah. can't see us. Rattlesnake, are you on? Yep. All right. Great. Do you have a question? How old is the oldest mountain lion currently living on the MPG Ranch? That is an awesome question. So the first mountain lion that we identified um, with DNA is her is F4, and we sampled her in December of 2012, and we resampled her last winter successfully. So in 2017. So we know based on that that so that's five years. And because she was a solitary individual at the time of sampling, we can say she was at least two. So she's probably at least seven years old, but she may be older than that. But we, we don't know for sure. But she's the oldest one that we know about on the ranch because a lot of them we've known since they were babies uh, and we've been following them around since then. But she's the oldest one on the ranch. I'm going to interject really quickly yeah. because Colville High School has just told us an adult mountain lion has 30 teeth. 30. 30 of them. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Colville. Oh, high school. Awesome. Rattlesnake, let's have another question or two from you. We're so sorry to not have called on you before. Wrong list. <laughs> How long can a mountain lion survive without food? That is another excellent question. I do not know at what point they have gone too far without food. I know that people can make it two to three weeks. Um, so my guess would be that it's probably pretty similar in that range, that if they're without food for two or three weeks, they're probably not going to make it. Does that happen often on the ranch, though? We do find uh, dispersing juveniles that have been infected have died. I've found, I've found that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mute your microphone, please. Uh, let's go ahead to Chinook. Final questions. Um, what are all the predators of a mountain lion? Oh. oh, there's a really good one. So the main predator is is us. So the largest threat to mountain lions uh, would be people and hunters. And then they're there can be uh, interactions between wolves and mountain lions where they they will kill each other depending uh, on numbers. But yeah, like uh, if you have multiple wolves and one lion, it's a bad day for the lion. If you have one lion and one wolf, it can be a bad day for the wolf. So so that's pretty much about it is us and wolves. 
One more question, Chinook. Okay. Um, how long can their teeth grow? Like how, like in terms of size? Like how big are their teeth, I guess? Uh, well, their canine teeth are, you know, probably about an inch and a half, maybe. Something like that. So those are their biggest teeth in there. Wow, cool. Thank you, Chinook. Let's go to Florence Carlton. Are they still there? Yep, we're here. Um, if most mountain lions do fight, how, how often will that happen? Ask again, please. If mountain lions do fight, how often will it happen? Cool, that's a really good, that's a kind of a big question. So what we see is that um, they're actually really tolerant of each other. So individuals, um, they don't want to, you want to avoid injury because like mountain lions don't have doctors to go to and the broken leg or something really messes them up. So they, they kind of avoid direct conflict a lot and you'll have like a large male that controls a territory and then will force dispersing smaller males out of that territory and current research is pointing towards mountain lions actually sharing kills with each other, being more social and more tolerant. So they're, they're not as just reclusive an individual um, as we previously thought. So we're learning a lot of new stuff about mountain lions, but they seem to be pretty tolerant of each other. That's great. Yeah. Well, let's, let's end up then a little bit about what you hope to learn and how your work is continuing on the ranch. Yeah, so we're going to be out again for another season this winter, and our hope is to continue to track the individuals that we know about, learn about family groups and the dynamics of those families, uh, and to learn how mountain lions use this property and the surrounding forest service land. Uh, each year we discover all sorts of new things and a lot of things that we had no idea or that we thought were one way and are completely different. Uh, and each year we discover new individuals, which is very exciting for us because we always think, you know, 06 was a lot of lions and now 11 was a lot of lions and now we know about 19 individuals, which is a lot of mountain lions for one area. So we hope to just continue to, to track the populations and see how they use the land. And we did have one RSS question about, um, what was it? Wolf. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. The Eastern Colony is wondering why you chose to study mountain lions. How'd you get into the study of mountain lions? Well, so I've been interested in this for a really long time and I started tracking when I was a little boy with my father and really enjoyed the discovery of, of these stories that are left on the land that you can go out there and like follow tracks to a kill site or like see what's going on with the interaction of individuals. So I was always really fascinated about how that worked and so I've been tracking for a long time and the opportunity presented itself here at MPG for me to do that and make it part of the work that I do so I was just the right guy in the right place at the right time and so now I get to study mountain lions that's amazing well teachers just so you know we're going to try and do another wonderful day at the ranch in December um, and so we'll give you information about that and also Joshua how would they get a hold of you if they have questions? Yeah so if you have any questions you can contact me through the MPG website which is mpgranch.com and any way that you connect to that there's a, an info at mpgranch.com email address or we have a web submission form or whatever all that stuff comes to me so if you're interested in visiting the ranch setting up a field trip any of that kind of stuff or just have general questions uh, you can send them to that. That's amazing. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much everybody. Thanks for yeah, joining us. Thanks. And there'll be some more Day at the Ranch at 12, 1 and 2. See you soon. <laughs> Goodbye Bye. everybody. Thanks everybody.